Thank you, Mr. Butler. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the Heart Summit. Harm Reduction, Empowerment, Addiction, Recovery, and Treatment. And the city of Annapolis, we are uh, glad to have you all here. So we're going to start the summit, uh, the panels. Uh, Rita Dorsey, Pastor Menendez, Lee Reagan, Captain Drummond. Edwards, Eric, Eric, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Aaron. Captain Drummond. That would be the love boy. Was that the love boat or? <laughs> yeah. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> so I, I wanted to jump over because Tola is honestly one of the most modest people I know. And uh, he, he, he quickly went through the Heart Summit what the acronym spells out, but he came up with that on his own without being provoked and without anyone even requiring that that be something that's done. So I want to give it up to Tolo because I think, I think, uh, and we talk about this all the time, all of us talk about all of our stuff all the time, but I think it's brilliant because um, at the heart of, of the opioid issue, if we think about that, is, is our, um, are, are all, are all of, of the things that, um, that lend itself to the human connection and lend itself to, to people healing. And as we all know, it can begin with the heart um, in a very physical way, obviously through blood, but it also has to do with our emotional connection to how we feel about ourselves and the world around us. So, all right, so let's kick this off, this first uh, panel. Um, which there was a PowerPoint slide for it, but we'll, we'll uh, make do. <laughs> um, so this first panel is called Opioid Use in the City of Annapolis, which um, there's also data on the slide. But um, our panelists are Rita Dorsey. Um, and Rita is a native of Annapolis, Maryland. Um, she does a lot of work in Newtown 20, uh, as well as Woodside Gardens, where she works um, as a resident service coordinator. Um, but she is also a community ambassador, so her, her, the list of the things that she does goes on and on. A lot of you all in this room probably already know her. Um, she's affectionately known as Miss Rita to all those that she serves within the community. Um, and there's a quote in here that Please do not attribute it to me because I'm the word, I'm just a messenger, but small in stature, but a giant in the spirit. So I would never call you small <laughs> at all. Um, but thank you for being on this panel. Um, also on our panel, we have Lee Reagan. Um, so Lee. I, I have uh, everything from her work, her undergraduate work at Florida State, so we can give it up for Florida State. <laughs> uh, she has a BS in criminology, um, and BS meaning a Bachelor of Science. Um, her career, that was a, anyway. Her, her career began uh, as a program director at uh, San, San Antonio Boys, a group home for troubled teens. Um, she also is a consultant, or has served as a consultant, in Anne Arundel County Mental Health Agency. Um, and a lot of her work is, has been done with recovery and working with the recovery walk. So thank you very much for being on this panel. <laughs> also on this panel is Pastor Cheryl Menendez, whose reputation precedes her um, in, in all of the work that she's done in all of our communities in the city of Annapolis, as well as Anne Arundel County, and probably the state of Maryland, and maybe even the entire country. Um, she's the founder and pastor of Light of the World Family Ministries in Glen Burnie. Um, but as we all know, she is all around. Um, I Most recently, which isn't in her bio, um, as I see it, but uh, she's doing a lot of work in Robinwood, and has brought together a lot of stake, uh, city stakeholders to begin reinvesting in some of the talent and people that are in a community like Robinwood. So we thank her for that. Um, she's also executive director of RCDC and has developed many partnerships with Anne Arundel County Schools, City of Annapolis Mayor's Office, 
Anne Arundel County Health Department, um, Adolescent Recovery Clubhouse, um, ASAP Coalition, um, which we have representatives from here, we'll give it up for them. Um, she currently serves on the HIV Commission, Infant Mortality in 10 Years in the State of Maryland, Minority Outreach um, and Technical Assistance Area, MOTA. So thank you very much, Pastor Luke. Thank you. And this next person is everywhere with us all the time, Captain Aaron Edwards, um, for a number of reasons. One of which is um, not only being a person who is a uh, responder, but also a person who's involved in every aspect of the kind of fight that we're up against, um, from showing up and handing out um, t-shirts to, <laughs> to literally setting up a table and being in communities with or without NAM or the city or the mayor's office, so we want to thank him for that. But he's been working in this city for 24 years, um, so we want to thank him for that, because that's an accomplishment. Um, he's also captain in charge of the EMS division, and he's dedicated a lot of his work on helping us understand the importance of distributing and providing access to Narcan. So, so some of what we will talk about, will, that, that he will talk about, will involve that area. But I would consider him a content expert in that area because of his uh, practical knowledge of how it works when you provide people with Narcan. Also, um, he's also worked on, on obviously, on hands-on CPR. There's a connection between um, training and kind of the peer-to-peer -peer learning piece, even as you relate to CPR trainings. So hopefully we'll get to the point where there is, they're kind of the same as being able to save someone's life. So, um, um, due to an overdose. So thank you very much for being on this panel. So let's jump right into it. Um, what we will do in this in this panel, as the panels proceed, is we will they will each um, give a very brief, probably 90 seconds at most, uh, introduction as to the areas they work in, and then we will move into. Uh, a couple questions, and then there will be questions from you all, and then we will finalize the panel by providing recommendations that help us in this particular in instance, how do we um, really help frame and elevate the importance of paying attention to opioid use in Annapolis. So I'll begin by on the right-hand side of the question. Good morning, everyone. Um, um, my 90 seconds would be that my focus mainly is on families and particularly children. Uh, we run the Adolescent Club Recovery Clubhouses both for uh, Annapolis and for Anne Arundel County. I didn't know how much you wanted me to say in this portion of it, but Tuffa okay. asked me to speak today about ACEs. Uh, that is a passion of mine. I'm very, very uh, involved in it. Uh, really, really concerned. We talk so much about the opiate situation, but I also want everyone to understand how important it is. Where did this start? How did this begin? There are some things that we don't deal with. So we put all these other things in place, but do not deal with some other pieces like your adverse childhood experiences. That is, we'll keep just spending our wills, spending our wills, because we'll keep creating new persons who are using, but we're not dealing with that, the, that family, the epigenetics of it, all the types of things that are generational, and that's where we're at, and that's my 90 seconds. I'm Rita Dorsey Washington. I'm um, the advocate for um, Newtown and Woodside Gardens. I'm created an ambassador at an senior high and predominantly focused on uh, the kids in Newtown and I'm the resident service coordinator with Side Gardens Departments. Um, my focus is on the providing Narcan training within our community. Um, myself, I've, I've helped to save two lives, and we have two other people in our community that are actively saving lives. Um, just the other day, I received uh, a bag full of empty containers, um, six actually empty containers of Narcan. It's a need within our community. Um, we're not being able to meet all the needs by providing them with um, recovery because they're not at that point. 
Uh, my biggest focus right now is being able to save lives and not being having someone, you know, a fatal overdose within the community. So my job is basically just helping equip the, the community to help save lives. And the community is actually saving lives every day. The ones that we know about and those that we don't know about. So that's what we're here for. I am Lee Reagan and I work with Arundel Lodge. I'm the clinic director of our um, outpatient mental health and substance use services. We're right here in Annapolis. We're uh, 1819 Bay Ridge Avenue. Um, and we have open access so people can walk in Monday through Friday and uh, get help with getting with an intake. Um, I have been in this field of substance use and mental health for going on almost 42 years. Um, my passion began with children and because um, adults scared me <laughs> because I was a child myself when I started but um, I have moved into the adult of the adult population and I would say that my focus is on treatment. I've worked in um, treatment uh, and providing care for people for a long time. And it's still, after all these years, I still have the same passion, if not more, than I did when I first started. Um, we also provide, and this is one of my big things, is like Rita and Pastor Cheryl and um, the captain here is about saving lives and even though people come into recovery and come into treatment and I know I'm a big talker and especially about this don't get me started but um, um, helping people once they get into recovery or believe they want recovery and like um, the Reverend spoke about over here about relapsing and how we can prevent that but we also have medication assisted treatment and I think that's essential in saving lives and um, preventing overdose fatalities as well. I probably took your nine minutes. <laughs> I'm Kat Merritt Edwards from the Annapolis Fire Department. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna take my 90 seconds and actually um, the modesty of Miss Rita is um, incredible. She Within one hour of an overdose, she had contacted me and we were able to get out there and have a pop-up Your Life Matters event and distribute 28 Narcan to people. She goes into apartment bill or she goes into places where she knows individuals and she brings them out to us. Uh, there was another event where we were able to do 25, but it was a, an, an event, um, a, uh, it was a new town, that event, but uh, all the women, the resource day. So we were able to get another uh, bunch out then. So people like Miss Rita are what we need throughout the city and what we need in each of these communities where, and they need to have somebody that they can call and contact and we can get out there quickly after we, have, we, we see something like this. Um, so that's my 90 seconds and uh, thank you. We're not done yet. <laughs> well, I'm, I just said that in general. <laughs> So, so um, as you all discussed, and I think um, as it was envisioned for this particular panel, we want to get kind of a snapshot or an idea of what uh, of what the issue is, um, the human issue of what's actually really going on in these communities, um, because data is really important, but also us understanding kind of um, and, uh, the feel of what is going on. So, one of the questions we wanted to ask was, um, what do you all actually experience and see on the ground and on the front lines. Can you give us some examples of what you're seeing? So let me just take a few minutes to say that I don't know if everyone's familiar with ACEs, but they are adverse childhood experiences. What I'm actually seeing is because I have ages 12 to 17 uh, with mental health co-occurring disorders of substance abuse or the governor back in 2017 allowed us for our actual actual adolescent recovery clubhouses, which are through Anne Arundel County Behavioral Health Department. Uh, we've had one in Robinwood for six six years, four months. 
and uh, we just opened up a new one in Brooklyn Park, Maryland. So when I'm working with children and I'm working with adults as well, what I am seeing is persons who are dealing with ACEs. The average childhood experience means that if you had an experience, uh, it was, it actually started, let me start with Dr. Valithi, back in 1965, uh, where he was actually running a camp or a uh, actual medical facility that dealt with persons who were dealing with the obesity. He had a person who was 408 pounds, but they were able to work with them for 52 weeks, and in 52 weeks, they came down to 132 pounds. What happened was, then after that, within 30, uh, 32 weeks, or maybe in three weeks, it wasn't, long, it wasn't a very long time, it wasn't 32, it was about three or four weeks, this person had gained about 90 or 80 some pounds back. When they actually talked to her, she said, uh, what, what, what happened? And she said nothing, and then they had to delve deeper. So this is what I want to start with you by saying. We do not tell our stories. We allow our families, uh, things that take place in our families, whether it was rape, whether it was incest, whether it was violence, whether you saw a parent, a mother who was maltreated, whether you saw domestic violence, those things stay in your prefrontal frontal cortex, which is I'm just a little biology here, of the amygdala, your memory, in your brain. And you go on, we go on, and let me speak personally for me, and this is why I do what I do with the children. I was one of those persons who was abused as a young child. I'm a pastor, I didn't tell it. I kept it for over 50 years and didn't say anything because you're told not to talk, not to say anything, not understanding that what you're doing is building a neural pathway, a road that actually causes you to end up in some other behaviors like substance abuse. And it's never dealt with. And we keep medicating ourselves. Um, bio so let me say from the bio biological standpoint, her name was Patty. And what she said was when she was younger, she finally told that she was a victim of incest by her own grandfather. We're finding out now that we have a lot of people who are dealing with incest rape. They did a study. This is, this is actually statistical data even by the CDC. So Dr. Felitti actually had a conference. He met with, Dr. with the CDC and they said, nobody's gonna believe this mumbo jumbo. He said, give me some statistics. So he said, if you get 26,000 people that you can interview and find out about this adverse childhood experience, and let me say to you, they were able to get 17,300 and some uh, women and men from all walks of life, and guess what they found out? They found out that over 67% of them have been victims of rape, incest, violence, mental health, issues in their family, chronic mental health issues in their family, where they saw parents or mother had left them, divorced, all of these things are causes of what we're dealing with right now. Let me tell you, and, and I know I don't have a long time, but the, I'm very passionate about this. In fact, I'm gonna give all of your ACE tests during your lunch hour if you'd like to take it. And what happened, they found out if you had, it's 10, 10 actual areas, and everybody has about one ace. But they're finding out when you have four or more aces, the adverse childhood experiences are what take place. When it's six aces or more, you have 4,106% chance of getting into substance abuse. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so we can build on that. Um, Again, uh, what are some of the things that you're seeing? Um, and, and looking at, at the kind of indicators and, and, and ways that people fall into um, uh, that trap and that issue. But, how, but what are you seeing in communities? I, and, and I'll even go deeper to provoke an answer is, um, let's talk about young people in communities and what you're seeing, what environmentally you're seeing going on. It goes back to what Pastor Cheryl just said, there are so many unaddressed issues within our community. We had children that are now adults have grown up with the same in the same patterns. They see this stuff on a daily basis. 
um, one particular situation, someone was stabbed, two people actually were stabbed in the community. Their blood laid out in the street for almost a week until a church that works within our community came to clean the blood up. Our children walk past this every single day. The two different people that I assisted in helping save their lives, I watched the video cameras afterwards to see how long they were out there. The first gentleman back in January laid out in that street for 15 minutes. People walk past because this is something that they see every single day. People walk past while he laid in that street. A car pulled up, got out of the car. I don't know what he did, but he got back in his car and he left out of the community. They're seeing this every day and they're not responding to it. Another situation, a man was at a bus stop and he, he OD'd at the bus stop. So many people gathered out there and you could see from the response when you gave out, um, when you came back to do the training. So many people were out there and people do not want to help because they're afraid that they're going to be associated with what just took place. We had people, and I tell people all the time, I grew up in Newtown 20. There are people that were molested. Those same people are still in that community. There are old men, old women, that are still in that particular community. It's a generational thing that you'll say not to say anything, and you continue to just to walk past it every single day and do nothing about it. I see that in the, in the community every single day. We have the Good Samaritan Law. We have to enforce that Good Samaritan Law when our responders come into our communities. Because if not, we're going to have more lives lost. Because when you say you're not going to ask any questions, they're assisting us in helping save lives. We don't know what else to do with it. We don't know what else to do with it. People ask me all the time, Miss Rita, what are we going to do? Ms. Rita doesn't have an answer. Only thing I can say right now is Narcan, because they don't want to deal with, or they haven't been given an opportunity to deal with what's, what caused it. There's so many different things that go on within that particular community that I'm in that have gone unaddressed, and that's where they're trying to numb whatever the issue is. Uh, most recently, and this is just the last um, one I'll share, most recently, a young girl OD one day. The next day, brought her back. The next day, she overdosed again in the street. When you hear this young lady's story, it bothers me that people in the community and other people on the outside of the community will talk about her. Nobody has offered her the help. She needs help and she doesn't know how to get it. So what she's doing is she's numbing it with the drugs. That's what I see in the community every single day. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, in the, in the um, I do treatment, and so in the outpatient uh, clinics, I, in our outpatient clinic here in Annapolis, I serve um, most of the people that um, come to see us are lifelong residents of Annapolis and they have um, mental health and substance use issues so we have groups that support their recovery um, that support their co-occurring um, mental health and substance use but again with what Pastor Cheryl and um, Rita were talking about is and I've known this ever since I've been in this field that it's trauma-based um, that people uh, numb out, use drugs because of the trauma that they've experienced, either physical or sexual trauma, or witnessing violence, or witnessing domestic violence, or witnessing someone being killed, or um, in the, in, I guess there's a couple of things that um, have prompted me to um, share about because none of this is um, really um, unique or um, different. We all see it, we all know it, but I agree we need to have a voice to it so that people can get down to their root cause of their use, the 
I have always believed I'm in recovery. I have 34 years of being sober and clean. And I believe that addiction is not the cause, it's the symptom, and that we have to get down to causes and conditions if we are going to begin to turn this around. And it takes everybody. It doesn't just take one specific person or one specific organization. It takes everybody. I see uh, Captain, uh, well, he's not a captain anymore, but Director <coughs> Simmons talked about the PCP and where I am. I have so much PCP. I have so much more. There for a while, cocaine, crack cocaine was like hardly around. It has re re it has surged up so much. PCP's always been around, but it's much more dangerous. There's they're making it much worse than it's ever been. Um, and then of course the opiates. And just a little bit of education, because um, I do learn from the people that I treat. <laughs> Since I don't use anymore, I don't, I'm not out there, so I don't know what's on the street. <laughs> so that's how I learn it. Um, we have been inundated. When you hear about people using painkillers or Xanax, it is not the prescription painkiller that you get from the doctor and you go to the pharmacy and get. It's not the prescription Xanax that you get from the doctor and you go to the pharmacy about. It is synthetic Xanax. It is synthetic painkillers. They're called pressed pills. And in those pressed pills are fentanyl. So it's much stronger than um, a Percocet that you would get from the pharmacy. And that is what's killing our people, is, are these pressed pills that come, I mean, they come in sheets, and they have, you know, sheets of Xanax. Well, they call them Xannies, but sheets of Xanax that are synthetic, that are 10 times stronger than the Xanax you get from the doctor, which are addicting, but that's what they're buying. So it just, that's what I'm seeing, are people that are, you know, it, and it's not even heroin anymore. It's just pure fentanyl um, is what's out there. And I have people that have overdosed 30, 40 times. I've had people that have, you know, overdosed, died, been brought back to life. I've had people that are having a struggle with being able to stop using because once you become addicted, then that obsession and that compulsion is there. And I also think that we need more education about what medicated assisted treatment is. You say it like that to people that I see, they look at you like you got three heads because it's a medical term. So we need to Stop using medical terms and use lay terms. Okay, so you 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 brought up something that that will move us to the last part, which is our recommendations. And I want you to hold on to the one that you just said because I think that was a powerful one. Okay. Um, and but I want to hear. Um, did you already get an opportunity to speak on this? I think you talked about your response to things, but did you want to speak on? Kind of what you're seeing on the ground because I have to keep us moving. Right. Um, okay. But please do. Please, Tom. So one of the, one of the things that you know with the behavioral health and the mental health aspect of things, we have found that the um, in the past we went in, we dealt with the patient, we took the patient to the hospital. That was where we ended. Um, we are looking at con contacting mobile crisis now to come in because it's not the person that just overdosed is not the only patient. There are multiple patients, whether it's a community, whether it's a family. Uh, so Mobile Crisis has actually asked us to. So our EMS supervisors and our engine officers and, and our paramedics are all told, you know, if there's a death, if there's a significant issue to contact uh, Mobile Crisis and they'll come in and they can help get people some assistance that they need. 
thought I was doing something excited, but the mic wasn't on. Um, so I, I came out here because I wanted to find out if any of you all had any questions um, that you wanted to ask any of the panelists or all of the panelists collectively. Are there any questions that you all have in relation to opioid use in the city of Annapolis? Or observations? Anybody have any observations as to what you heard? Hi, I'm Diane Chief Christian. This is uh, for uh, Pastor Menendez. Yes. I was just curious because you were talking about the. Uh, uh, in, your, in your curiosity about how people got started, which is something that very much interests me, I wondered if you'd identified anything specific. It sounds like you're, you've been looking at genetic and generational play, cultural issues, and I just was looking for insight on how some of the solutions that you might have to some of those things that we identified. Thank you, sir. A very good question. So what has been found out is that if there are seven different things that can happen, but one of the most important ones is to have nurturing, healthy relationships. And I think Rita evaded to it is the fact that how people now have become so detached that they can walk around someone. We have gotten away. If there is a chemical um, in our, uh, that we can have in our body that is called oxytocin. It's what causes the mother to lactate. It's that touching, it's the, and it's the issue that's in our school system as well. I, I have an MOU with that on the county public schools that I've had for, I've been with them for 28 years. The most important thing is building healthy relationships. But if we're so detached, we don't know how. Thank you. Are there any other responses to that question? Okay, are there any other questions from you all? Don't be shy. Are there any other questions? Okay. So at this point, um, so that we can move it forward, um, we want to really dive into, for you all, whom we consider content experts around this area, which is why you're on this particular panel. If you could pull from some of what you said, which I took notes on, um, as to some recommendations. So when we talk about op opioid use in the city of Annapolis, specifically that, and kind of those issues that you brought up um, in terms of not just prevention, but kind of how you respond to it and the amount, the quantity of uses, the different types of, uh, of drugs that you find people are using to self-medicate, and in your case, domesticize, you know, I mean, all, all of those things like, what are some recommendations that we could elevate um, to either our policymakers or to those who provide services in that area or even grant funding, right? So what are some recommendations to get to the... Um, I would recommend, like I had talked about before, I think that we need um, not only the Narcan because that saves lives, but taking it one step further with medication-assisted treatment and education about what that is because a lot of people don't want to take pills, they don't want to have an injection, they don't want to go to the doctor, that sort of thing. And there's all kinds of different kinds of medication assisted treatment. There's methadone, there's suboxone, there's Vivitrol, there's um, uh, naltrexone, oral naltrexone that can help. Um, and I think that that's important that, because that helps with the obsession and the craving to continue to use once the addiction is full-blown. Okay, I'm gonna be a hypocrite. Okay. Um, so it's like a physician. <laughs> it's like a physician heal thyself. So, because I'm in no way succinct. Um, but I want you all, as you frame these recommendations, I want you to think about the, the way that we can elevate and articulate a clear-cut, recommendation that we can, in a, in, in, a, in a couple sentences, that we can elevate, note, and then take on, and really I say we, meaning you all, because all of you all are on uh, the, you know, work on in this area. So can you, can you give a, a concise recommendation? Hey, um, a mobile van in Annapolis. Okay, okay, see, there you go, see. 
Okay. I would also agree with the mobile van and that was straightforward to the point we they can do everything. Okay. Some type of a mobile health that wouldn't just be specific to drug or opioids, but it could be for everything, behavioral health, regular physical I mean, just everything. Mental, all of it. Okay. Thank you. I'll just say more programming. Uh, I don't mean just teaching some stuff, but I'm talking about having programming for youth. That, that would be my recommendation. And even in the school system, there has to be more training about this. So when you say youth pessimists, do you mean, can you give an age range? Uh, that 12, well, that's not true. Uh, so let me just say this real quick. The brain, because I gotta share this with you. I mean, I got you, I'm having to understand this. We don't have the oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin to make decisions. It starts coming in at age 12, not completed to the age 26. So we need those young people out in the streets because they're seeing, they've watched people lay down with PCP and out there in Robin when I've been there. So we need training and education for them, programs starting there at the young generation, that young group, and uh, up until that 17, 18, and beyond. Okay, thank you. So did we capture that? So we have the mobile van, we have um, programming. I, I also connect that to the funding, right? So the, the other piece is, right, is allocating resources so you can do those programs, right? That's what it is? Yes. Okay. My recommendation would be um, continue to uncover it and let it be known. Um, also, if it happens in the streets, address it in the streets. Example was when the guy OD'd at the bus stop. We were out in the street at the bus stop with the dark hand and training people. So uncover it and put it out in the streets. Okay. So I want to thank you all. Um, I'm not quite done because I'm going to be further provocative since we have a few minutes. I'm going to provoke some other things. Uh, um, because I know all the work that you all do. So. Um, Let's touch on the streets, right? So we, one of the reasons why uh, it's been elevated in the city of Annapolis um, is because the misnomer was that the overdoses and the rates of addiction were higher in certain populations, right? And including geographically, that it was a kind of county issue and suburban issue and um, one of the things that, that TOLA's been doing um, in terms of uh, developing programs and working with OEM um, is going where people are, right? And that, obviously that's nothing new. We don't have a million dollars, we're working. Last year, we really didn't even have a budget. Um, and this year, you know, uh, luckily we got more. But can you touch on like the power of being, going where people are? That was one of the big points about the Your Life Matters project. That not everyone can get out to the health department. Not everyone has that ability to get transportation to Glen Burnie or areas true. And so getting this out there and getting in the field, and as Ms. Rita had said, that was a special occasion when we were able to do it within an hour of uh, an overdose, getting right there in the middle of, the, of uh, Newtown and just people coming out. And, can I respond real quick is that the health department is asking for peer support specialists so we do need people who can relate to what's going on everybody can't do this that's that's just it but we need people who can relate and they are looking for peer support specialists right now they've asked me to if you have people in the community and community people got to be involved they have to because there's a certain rule out there that you walk up there and you act like you're going to help somebody they're like huh, who are you but they want people who can identify with them thank you so i've been told that we need to um push it along i want to also uh, elevate a couple things that i that i myself observed and thought was really powerful which was talking about trauma which 
at some point in the future, we will have an entire thing about trauma. Because as we all know, we are all experiencing trauma from the middle passage all the way to families, to the internet, to information. Um, so trauma affects all of us, and we can really get to some of those issues. Yes? Before you finish, do I have a minute just to kind of ask a question or make a point? Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. Just want to finish that. Yeah. So Pastor Cheryl was talking about trauma, right, and the relationships, the healthy relationships. So, so I work with the Strengthening Families Program, which I want Pastor Cheryl to comment on that. I think we need more. We need more prevention programs to avoid people going that route. So we need more funding for this type of program. So Pastor Sheriff, you can comment on the positive benefits of strengthening families, what can yes. do for our families, Hispanics, African Americans, whites, please. Yes, Louise. And I, I can't talk specifically right now because everything hasn't been approved yet, Louise, but there are going to be more strengthening families programs. How many of you are familiar with them? There's the SAMHSA based program, 14 weeks for families. That it's being, some things are being added. We'll talk offline, okay? But there are some more things that are taking place. All right. Does everyone know what, what's meant by SAMHSA based? Everyone familiar with SAMHSA? And, you know, evidence based, data driven, um, you know, yes, sir. Sir. just mentioned yeah. a little bit of the benefits. Of Let, the, the benefits. Program. Well, um, the health department actually did their actual graduation at our building uh, in Glen Burnie uh, a, a couple of months ago. It was amazing. When you look at, I have never seen a group, and I've been doing strengthening families for, I guess, 17 years. But the people that showed up, diversity, um, you had African American, you have Latina, you have everybody there in that group. And to see fathers that were there, to see the change, to see the tears, to see, what had taken place in their lives was amazing. And I recommend if you don't have one, we're going to be doing two. See me, want to take care of that. And please, during the lunch hour, don't forget, I'm going to give all of you the ACE test if you want to take it. Okay. Okay. We, uh, were, did you want to respond to that also? Or, oh, I thought you were. Okay. So we have one person who had a comment, and then we have to push it on. I keep saying that, but we have two minutes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so just to, and I think this recommendation I think should be on the list, and I think it came from the panelists. Um, one being the fact that we should use lay terms. I think that should be in there because like when you talk about the math, not many people understand what that is. You said that and I thought that was really very important. Um, and that also gives credence to the work of peer educators. And then I think the other thing um, is also related to I think you forgot that. But then on to another thing, the health department recently through BHA got some funding um, that is meant to go to community-based organizations. I'm not sure we're aware, targeting minority populations on this opioid issue. Um, so I would encourage everyone to reach out to their health departments concerning this funding. It's available for minority-based organizations that work with the Office of Minority of Engage or for organizations that serve minority populations. It's a bucket of funds that I think we can make use of. And I think the other recommendation that I was trying to remember was when somebody talked about the children and family members of people that are affected by opioid overdose, whatever can be done. I was glad to learn about the physician police um, partnership reaching the individuals within 24 hours, but the children of the direct family members is a recommendation that is major that we should not forget as we do this. Thank you. Can you, I walked up on it, because I want, I want you to tell people who you are. So okay, they want, I, So if I, they want to speak with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Olubukola Alonde, and I work with the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Pastor Cheryl, I saw you mention that you used to be a multi-grantee. Yes. Um, I work on that multi-grant, and in February, actually, I had um, both um, uh, Mr. Rowell and um, told that present at MDH on this opioid issue we talked about it during Black History Month. Um, so yeah, so that's what I do. Yes. And I'll be one of the reviewers for the grant. Oh, or Amber Oh, really? Yes. And we'll be one of the grantees. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking power to me. Don't tell me. I know, I'm not telling you. That's, that's, 
at uh, Aspirational. Okay, so um, I want to thank you all, and all of us want to thank you for, for this panel. Um,